We'd like to thank the Newton Wellesley Hospital Substance Use Services Council who has started th this event for us and is hosting this event for us tonight. So again, drug use is on the rise and how do you identify signs in your child or loved one? We're gonna start with four panelists tonight and we'll have ample time for a question and answer session. So please use the Q&A button for us tonight to be able to ask questions to the panelists and I'll be moderating this evening. Our first speaker is Dr. Katrina Armstrong. She's the Associate Director and Co-Founder of the Substance Use Services at Newton Wellesley Hospital. And she's also on the Infectious Disease Staff. She studied medicine at the University College Dublin School of Medicine and completed her internal medicine training and residency training at Mass General Hospital and her fellowship in infectious diseases at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. We are incredibly lucky to have her uh, as the Associate Director of our Substitute Services. She has received numerous awards for her own and the team's clinical ex excellence. And she leads numerous community-based efforts around addiction prevention and treatment, including excellent efforts with the Boston Bulldogs Running Club, supporting individuals impacted by addiction. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Molly Blazar Leibowitz. She's a pediatric emergency medicine physician at Newton Wellesley Hospital and she grew up here in Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, she graduated from Harvard Medical School and completed her pediatric residency and emergency medicine fellowship training at Boston Children's Hospital. And she, we, she has been with us here at Newton Wellesley since 2015. I'm also pleased to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Buma. She is the Chief of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Newton Wellesley Hospital and she's the director of the division's community health in initiative, the Resilience Project. She tra trained and received her uh, medical degree from Will Car uh, Carnell Medical College, and she did her child psychiatry residency at MGH and McLean and her fellowship program there as well. She's been with Newton Wellesley Hospital since 2015 and became chief of the division in 2018. And finally, we'd like to introduce Katie Sugarman, who is the Prevention and Outreach Program Manager for the Natick Health Department. And she's also Program Director for the Natick 180 Coalition. And she is working very diligently about, around reducing substance use disorders in Natick and was recipient of the 2020 Commonwealth Heroines Award, uh, nominated by Senate President Karen Spilka for efforts to address addiction and mental health in the Metro West. And so we're very pleased to have all of these speakers here. And I'll again remind everyone where they work and what they do briefly before they speak. We're gonna start with Dr. Katrina Armstrong and we're very pleased to have you all here tonight. Please again, use the Q&A button to uh, list questions for us that we will answer at the end of our presentations. Each speaker will speak around 10 to 15 minutes and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of all of them. Thank you again. Dr. Armstrong. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can everybody see the screen okay? So welcome uh, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. I'd like to um, take some time to go over um, the following uh, aspect of our, our webinar tonight, drug use is on the rise and how to identify it in your loved ones. I'd like to first start by just introducing our substance use services team and, and to thank them. Um, we are a team of clinicians, social workers, coaches, um, and uh, medical assistants. And uh, we're the, the boots on the ground here at Newton Wellesley Hospital, helping individuals with and their families with substance use in the community. So I wanted to take a moment to thank each and every one of the members of our team here uh, for all of the hard work that they do to care for individuals in our community that are struggling with substance use disorder. So over, overview here, we will focus on some trends in the general population highlight highlighting really teens and college age patterns, and then reviewing some specific drugs, focusing on really the highest use. 
I'd like to just start with general trends in the United States. And I bring this slide up because it is striking and it's important to recognize that um, coming into 2021, unfortunately, we have a general trend throughout the country of increasing uh, numbers of drug overdose deaths. And this includes both um, opioid and um, an increase in opioid combined with stimulant overdose deaths. It is up about 30.5%, and that's consistent nationally and within the, United, um, within the United States and in the Massachusetts area. In general, Massachusetts um, has that increase of 30% um, in the past year, and that's, that's 32 deaths really per 100,000 residents, 55% higher than the national average in Massachusetts. And 18% of these patients do not receive treatment for their opioid use disorder. In general, um, when patients do survive an overdose, they're 100 times more likely to die within the year and 18 more times to, uh, likely to die by suicide. The one-year mortality is about 5.5% uh, post-overdose. So it's important for us to talk about the trends um, across the nation um, and in Massachusetts, um, both, uh, both adults and um, our, our teens and younger individuals. In terms of trends, um, what we see more often in Newton Wellesley Hospital is alcohol use disorder, and in particular with women. And what we saw over the past years trending up even to now in a uh, study is an increase in, uh, in alcohol-related deaths, um, particularly in women. This is related to alcohol liver disease, and um, the, the trend continues to increase in women uh, far greater than men. In terms of Massachusetts, it's again consistent across the nation. Massachusetts has um, fortunately one of the lowest rates of um, under 21 related drinking deaths. But um, in terms of alcohol use across the board, there are still a significant amount of annual deaths. Um, primarily um, related to drinking deaths are, are uh, males over females. In terms of the CDC estimates, the potential life lost to uh, years uh, 49,020 49, years of potential life loss to alcohol related deaths. And that's a, a 3.1 um, rate average over 10,000. So alcohol is up in Massachusetts um, in adults and in, um, in younger folks. In terms of the setting around COVID, um, this increased alcohol use and in terms of sales between um, uh, in, in person and overall sales went up to 243% and an increase in binge drinking in general, in particular women uh, greater than men. In terms of general population data on nicotine and marijuana in 2021, 12.5% of US adults, an estimated of over 30 million smoked cigarettes um, with greater percentages of 14% of men and 11% of women. And in terms of marijuana use, 18% um, of Americans use um, have been using marijuana at least at least once um, in the years between 2019 coming into 2020. An estimated three out of 10 people um, who have used marijuana um, have meet criteria for a marijuana use disorder. So those are the general trends. I'd like to focus just a little bit more on um, the US teens and teens into college age. So the, the main data source for this is a large study that was started in 1975 called the Monitoring for the Future Study. And these are the results that came up through 2020. Some of the results around college age were um, uh, did not come up through 2019 through 2021 due to this the discontinuation of college, um, uh, typical college years, but we do have data that goes up through 2020. So I'd like to just start with some, some good news overall. What you can see here is that the majority of the data shows us that since 2011, both eighth, eighth, 10th, and 12th grades have decreased overall in all substance use um, over these year statistics. And in 2021, we see that um, the rates of uh, overall illicit um, drug use is, is way down. 10% for eighth graders, 18 for 10th, and for 32 for 12th graders. So overall, we see that the trends um, of overall illicit drug use are down. It's important to point out that in general, alcohol is, is the most prevalent followed by marijuana in terms of teen use. And I will mostly be talking about grades eight through 12, um, but also foc focusing on um, teens older at entering into college. There have been some increases between eighth and 10th grades of, um, of use in general, as you'll see, um, but in general trending down since 2011. 
It's important to point out here that vaping um, for nicotine and marijuana rates do remain high. And um, in terms of Massachusetts compared to the national trend, 33% uh, overall higher use in teens than the US average. So Massachusetts tends to have more overall use. This is what the overall um, uh, trends look like coming up to 2021, and as I said, in all grades going down by um, a significant percentage, which is, which is hopeful. In terms of vaping, though, I think it's important for us to point out that these trends held steady. Um, in terms of 12th graders, the rate of vaping in general is 34 and 10th is 30 and 8th graders is 16%. And this is both a nicotine and vaping, nicotine vaping and um, past year of Juul um, use. Now, these trends have trended down over the past um, two to three years, but they do remain steady compared to other um, statistics. In terms of the frequency in the past 30 days, again, these numbers um, are a significant portion and they come up through 2020. And they are the, the statistics that are leveling off as opposed to really trending down in terms of the numbers that we see overall across the nation. In middle school, we do still see, um, in terms of past 30 days, uh, frequent uh, vaping and um, rates for daily vaping. And when we talk about frequent vaping, that is within uh, uh, 20 of the 30 days. What is, what is being used in um, vaping is uh, both flavors alone, um, which is on the far right, far left bar in the dark color, um, nicotine and marijuana. And you'll see that in 10th graders, um, there is a significant amount as well as in 12th graders of nicotine and, um, and marijuana kind of staying steady um, in both of these over the past few years. In terms of the percentage um, reporting uh, vaping and um, how many people do, again, these numbers are consistent from 2018 to 2020 and they remain, um, they do remain steady and have not decreased significantly. In terms of um, the marijuana vaping in particular, these numbers, again, um, have remained high um, up to 2019 and decreased slightly in 2020 in all grades. And this is overall past marijuana use, which is the same, uh, same depiction. In terms of alcohol in these three grades, these, um, these, these trends have really leveled off as well. And the highest rates, again, are in the 12th grade with 50, 55%. And this is rates um, on the left-hand side of, five, of binge drinking five or more drinks in a row and past use of um, alcohol overall on the right-hand side. In terms of alcohol trends, as you can see, um, 50, the, the, the trends have decreased 50% um, in teens since 2009, but overall have leveled off over the past few years. It's important to point out that pandemic, um, uh, pandemic drinking has changed and shifted. And what's been seen is that um, there is a higher percentage of um, teenagers that uh, are, are drinking with permission with their parents. And what's happening um, in the data that's being seen so far is that in ages 15 to 16, um, they are uh, drinking in the household and also a large percentage of the younger sibling, which is uh, ages 12 to 13. The concern here is that um, there's a number of studies that have shown that in, in uh, young um, individuals that 45, 47% of teens that started drinking by age 14 had a use disorder um, later on in life versus 9% that waited until age 21. And in another study that 14 year olds that um, were allowed to drink with their parents um, were twice as likely to drink heavily or binge drink within the year following. I think in general, it also um, has been really discussed that around pandemic drinking and drinking within the household really um, sends a message that's very confusing about resiliency and, and how to manage the difficulties around pandemic with the use of substances versus relying on relationships and, um, and other important um, areas of, of a teen's life. I'd like to just point out that overall, we're seeing um, a decrease in opioids in all teens, but um, a very concerning uh, article was published recently in JAMA that showed that although the overall rate of use of opioids is down, the rate of overdose is actually up. And unfortunately, in teens age 14 to 18, the overdose rate has doubled between 2019 and 20, and then rose another 20% into 2021. And the thinking here is that it is um, 
that the overall rates of, of use are down, but they have become more dangerous with higher rates of very, um, very high potency fentanyl in general. The other um, important thing to point out is that the pills that are coming into the country um, are hugely adulter adulterated with fentanyl and high rates of fentanyl overall. So it is important to notice that when um, teens are purchasing um, pills on the street, the rates of fentanyl are extremely high. And this is a recent study that was up until 2021. It's also uh, an important fact that the combinations and practices of use of opioids by um, younger folks and teens are, are deadly combinations. There is an influx of um, uh, illicit benzos that are on the street. And then often many of the, the, use, uh, the uses of benzos are also um, uh, synthetically made and mixed with fentanyl. And these lead to higher rates and risk of uh, fatal overdose from respiratory depression. There's other practices that are also very concerning around the use of um, illicitly um, used substances, including um, practices such as parachuting when um, in teens take the medication with um, wrapped in, in tissue, which decreases the, increases the surface area and makes it a higher potency drug. The other um, piece of information that has come out of the uh, monitoring for the future study has been a slight increase in eighth graders in particular coming into 2020 for the following things, which include amphetamines, um, and this would be um, uh, use of um, illicit Adderall, et cetera, inhalants of all types and cough medicine. Another aspect of uh, COVID-19 and pandemic has been um, really revealing that there is an increase in drug use um, that is associated with uh, transmission of COVID-19. So the impact of, um, of vaping overall and, um, and this happening throughout the communities has seen that in children and teens that have increased use of, of um, all forms of illicit use, including vaping, there are higher rates of transmission of uh, COVID-19. So just briefly on college age students where we do have some data, what we've seen in general is that um, we, we demonstrate some, some decreases overall in all substances, including um, stimulants and opioids, but marijuana and nicotine um, use have overall leveled off. And this really just goes through trends. These trends come up through 2019 into, 2018 into 2019, but show that opioid use in general is down both in college and um, college age, um, whether they're attending college or not. In terms of marijuana use, this has overall leveled off coming into 2019. And um, this is both for daily use and use in the past year. Again, um, the use coming between 2018 and 19 is about 6% in college attending and then uh, 11 in non-college. Um, the numbers are higher in terms of what is um, happening in vaping. Um, vaping marijuana tends to be higher, um, coming up to closer to 11% in college students and eight in uh, non-college. And um, overall nicotine vaping is also up at about 15% coming into 2019, 12 for non-college attending. And in terms of overall stimulant use um, and what was uh, described as Adderall use, there's significant, um, there is some increases overall coming into 2019. And that's as far as the data really goes for monitoring for the future due to the, the stop in college for periods of time and data collecting. But there is an increase in uh, by 11%. And it seems to be that there is an overall um, dis uh, difference in gender. So college females about 8.8% and almost 15 in college males for past year of misuse of, of stimulants in particular Adderall. And in terms of binge drinking, overall, this has uh, leveled off, and it is described in, in college students at about 28% report binge drinking within the last two, um, two weeks or so. So this is the breakdown of college students in terms of what's mostly seen. And again, marijuana is the highest rate, um, followed by uh, cocaine, um, hallucinogens, and ecstasy, and then other inhalants. In terms of, so I thought I would just take a moment in my last few slides to really describe the, the changes in um, that we're seeing with marijuana and in particular vaping. In general, what we see with the THC, which is the potent uh, cannabinoid found in marijuana is that it is about 34 to 40% higher than it was 20 years ago. The uh, typical types that we, we're seeing in marijuana nowadays 
are um, both um, the smoked leaf hash oil salvia and then the roots are are primarily it seems to be vaping um, as opposed to other formulations of roots of smoking or um, oral there is an increase in edibles and um, at the end we may have some time to talk about those um, the overall signs um, I will not get into right now, but um, um, I will leave for, for this time. In terms of why we care about this increase in cannabinoids and marijuana is what we see in, in developing brains and developing brains up to age um, 25, 26 is that it does have known adverse effects on certain brain areas. That, um, that deal with emotional processing and coordination. And these can affect someone for two to six hours with delayed reaction and up to um, 24 hours, which increases, uh, increases uh, car accidents and, and other forms um, of uh, dangerous activity. Also important to point out marijuana use before 18 doubles the chance of a use disorder developing. So just in, in summary, in our last few slides, I'll talk a little bit about vaping um, as it was seen as a trend that was almost um, increasing over uh, all of the different studies. And in general, um, it's defined as a, a substance where um, uh, is heated in the point of a vapor. It can be used as um, with cannabis, as flavoring or as nicotine. And in general, um, the concern here is the many different substances that have been found in vaping devices over the past few years. In a recent Harvard study, there was over um, 51 um, different vaping devices that were analyzed and 75% contained dangerous materials. So a vaping device um, looks like this. It is a cartridge with a heated element um, where substances are put in and, and used for vaporization. The typical one we hear about is um, our jewels. Um, they have uh, a much higher percentage of nicotine when used that way and can have a very high potency. And these are just an array of the vaping devices over the years with the most common being on the far, far right, which is pod based and looks like a USB device. Other devices are very hard to find um, and can be very difficult to, um, to know what is a vape and can come in many different forms, such as watches, uh, hoodies, and um, even lipsticks. There's a number of different chemicals that are, are sold with vaping devices and um, are very appealing, especially to younger, um, younger folks that have started vaping at a young age. In terms of getting an idea of how much nicotine is in current um, devices, on the far left is um, about 20 milligrams in a pack of cigarettes and some of the um, active um, use of devices right now has the equivalent of 90 milligrams of nicotine, which is equivalent to 90 cigarettes overall. Some more um, different devices um, have different formulations and can be used for vaping oils and um, actual whole leaf. And it's important to um, just to be aware of some of what these different devices look like as they rapidly change, including the ones that are single use and can be delivered directly to um, individuals' houses. Um, just a, a brief uh, information on overall um, materials. These are um, oils that are, are very high potency and often called um, uh, used as what's called dabs. They are highly concentrated and have a very high rate of THC and are used within va vaping devices and can deliver incredibly potent amounts of THC. Um, in terms of just some final slides, just on why, what the data looks like for um, individuals and teens who are vaping and where these are mostly coming from in the, in the teenage eighth to 12th grades is, is mostly from friends, vape shops, family members, and even convenience stores. And in terms of looking at why teens vape, um, this large study through the CDC really was um, leading out at curiosity but um, other reasons for just um, looking at why vaping is happening and why it's continuing is, is about peer pressure. Um, and the striking numbers are really down around um, when teens are reporting trying to stop using tobacco. And this came out in another study that was done the same year that looked at the reasons for vaping. And what I highlight here is um, the 8.1% that um, reported vaping because they um, feel addicted to it and, and have a real difficult time stopping. Big tobacco is behind most of these devices and, um, and there is no slowdown in, in the amount that they're being sold and marketed and um, in towns all over. And just being aware of what is being sold to our, our younger children. So um, devices that are really appealing to, um, to kids. And when kids have started, it was noted that they did 
um, use products that started with a flavor and then moved on to nicotine. Um, and social media is very active within the, um, the Juul and vaping devices and, um, and, and very appealing to really younger age and, and high school. Um, this is just some um, opportunities to look at how vapes can be um, marketed in jewelry, in hoodies, um, in many different areas for, um, for use. So just a few more words just on nicotine and some of the data that um, we see with nicotine and vaping that one in three middle school um, students use nicotine products um, um, and when they use them they use two or more and the use of multiple products um, increases the rate of addiction. Finally, I'll just mention just some of the reasons why these chemicals are so concerning and that we know on the left that there is over 7,000 chemicals found in cigarettes, but the chemicals found in vaping devices include um, what is put in there and known nicotine and ultrafine chemicals, but all of these um, heavy metals, as well as volatile organism, uh, volatile um, materials have been what's led to some of the, the issues around um, very devastating presentations with um, uh, lung injury. So the concern with vaping in general, that it's harmful, um, nicotine is harmful on its own. It progresses in all of the studies to cigarette smoking, and usually it's dual use, both vaping and smoking. Increases the addiction to other substances, including stimulants and opioids, and also has been linked to um, difficulties with mental health disorders and a number of other um, illnesses. In terms of the um, specific data on rates of vaping to cigarettes, uh, 12 to 15 year olds considered low risk for smoking, vaping was associated with a 9% increase in the odds of, of smoking. In studies noting that vaping, in, uh, that vaping increases the risk of other um, drug use, cocaine and methamphetamine. Finally, um, in individuals trying to, to use vaping for quitting smoking, this really has not shown out in the studies and, and really only about 9% have been able to quit um, cigarette smoking um, uh, in a large study in using vaping and e-cigarette devices to do so. Finally, the illness is seen, you've probably heard before, e which is um, e-cigarette related um, injuries as well as hard metal lung diseases and um, bronchiolitis are different injuries seen um, throughout the 2018 to up to date um, timeframe of difficulties that have been noted with the um, vaping devices. Um, we did go into um, how COVID presents and higher rates of COVID transmission in um, uh, individuals that report vaping. Finally, I'll end on um, edibles um, as this is one of the increasing drugs. It's important to understand that there's, it's, it's very confusing around uh, marijuana and THC, but edibles um, are really coming in the form of gummies and have been very, very, um, uh, have been, had a steep increase in general um, in the market and marketed towards teens. In general, edibles are what's called CBD, which is cannabidiol, cannabidiol. And it's a highly concentrated, made with highly concentrated cannabis, but can be used in hash oil and infused butter. It can be mixed into cakes, brownies, teas, and candies, and it's unregulated in most cases. Um, and often many other drugs that have been found in some of the gun gummies that have been found on the market. They're uh, marketed to kids and they're very well known um, and seen that they're, they're similar to other known candies and can be confused. It's important to not be confused that this is different from marijuana and cannabis. CBD oil is um, an oil that has been marketed for muscle tension and anxiety, but in large doses can cause extreme drowsiness and lethargy. And what happens with kids um, using some of these formulations is they tend to take gummies um, at an excess amount and get into situations where they are taking high rates that are um, uh, leading into a uh, mere overdose. And it can be very difficult to um, see what actually has CBD versus what does not. Um, they can take one to three hours to have an effect. And so uh, a teen by taking them may take more than they're expecting um, expecting a use and it's, um, it can lead to high rates of overdose from THC, which often needs medical intervention. So I, I think I'm at my time and I'm going to stop. Um, I know this is a whirlwind of what the epi and some of the, the different um, 
um, use drugs that are in not only in our general population, but really looking at our teens and college age and what to be aware of. Some of our other speakers will talk about having those conversations and what to look for within um, not only our schools, but in our, our own families and how to have those conversations about, about these, um, uh, the dangerous use. So thank you so much for, um, for listening. And I will, um, I'd like to uh, have Ancha uh, introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. That was a whirlwind, but it was an excellent overview of what we're seeing out there. And I, I definitely have a few questions about some of the slides that you presented, which we'll address at the end. And feel free to put any questions in the Q&A or you can send them to me uh, or the speakers by the chat button. So with that, I will introduce Dr. Lee Woods and she'll tell us a little bit about what, what she's seeing in the emergency department at Newton Wellesley Hospital. Hi guys, I'm Molly Leibowitz. I work in the pediatric emergency department at Newton Wellesley. Um, and I thought I'd sort of walk you through some of the things I'm seeing in the hospital and have been in the past years, and also sort of what the process is when coming in for questions of substance use, um, alcohol, drug use. Sort of break it down into a few groups that I think about, sort of echo what Dr. Armstrong is saying, and that in sort of this community, we are not seeing a huge amount of um, other overdoses, the majority of what is coming into the hospital is alcohol and marijuana use in sort of the broad sense of that. Definitely we see a few other things and I'm primarily working in the pediatric ER and so I cannot speak to all of the things that are going on in the adults, but for the younger kids, teens and college age, it is primarily alcohol and marijuana use. Um, in terms of alcohol and sort of going through a step-by-step -step of what happens coming into the emergency room is the majority of people who have to be seen for that are usually coming in from college parties and sometimes from high school going out with friends. We've seen the high school age group sort of increasing sometimes with COVID, people going to friends' houses and sort of putting into words what um, Dr. Armstrong is saying is people getting together in small houses and then having overuse drinking, binge drinking, and then ending up in the emergency room. That's also what's happening in the college age, these large parties, especially after the break of college with COVID and coming into the emergency room, sort of needing respiratory health, fluids, hydration, and nausea. Most of the kids are come in, are monitored, some get fluids monitored overnight and it can be hours that they're sort of with us being in the emergency room with alcohol and most of them do fine in sort of more extreme circumstances they need more support. What is interesting is that going up with the marijuana use we're also seeing an increase in vaping coming in and that has probably been in the past few years seeing much more vaping and in younger ages. And associated with that is sort of chronic cough, difficulty breathing, increase in asthma symptoms, sort of chest pain, and these are ongoing symptoms. So we can see people coming in with sort of acute symptoms. I just baked for the first time yesterday. I was trying something new. I got something from somebody else. Um, sort of concerns of mixing marijuana with other substances, other products, nicotine with other things they don't know and who they're getting their products from. So knowing, you know, could this be contaminated with other things, um, how pure it is, how strong it is. And then we're also seeing kids over the long term having chronic cough, chronic difficulty breathing. And this was of sort of highest concern also with the transmission of COVID, people having increased work of breathing and certainly doing worse with COVID and other respiratory illnesses. And the respiratory illnesses that we were not seeing a few years ago at the beginning of COVID are certainly on the rise now. And we're still seeing all these kids who are vaping, having more breathing issues, needing more interventions, lab work, x-rays, and certainly more admissions than before. I think for me, um, personally seeing what's coming in, uh, marijuana is one of the highest groups that we're seeing. And the things that we're seeing is both sort of the vaping, smoking, and the edibles. I'll talk sort of about two different groups. One is the intentional use from the older kids, and then the unintentional use from um, 
little kids getting into edibles. So we have been seeing marijuana use going up both in the teenagers and college age kids. The most striking thing is the increase in cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. So this has sort of been in the news and talking about cyclic vomiting, which is a syndrome of profuse and vomiting that can often need hospitalization, fluids, and even admission overnight for medication to sort of be able to hydrate. There is an association and sort of a subset of the cyclic vomiting with cannabis hyperemesis. And this can be with high dose of cannabis and chronic use. Some of the things to look out for in teens and older young adults is chronic use of marijuana, high use of marijuana, but also an association with needing to repetitively shower. Um, and sorry, somebody just asked a question. I don't have any slides. I'm just gonna continue talking, but thank you. Um, so they have continuing uh, chronic use and hot showers. And this can be sort of something to look out for if you're concerned about uh, chronic marijuana use and hyperemesis. And not all hyperemesis is associated with marijuana, but this is definitely a subset. And this is more at risk for teens and children than it is for adults. And I think the rate of this has gone up and we're now at about 3%. When people present with chronic um, hyperemesis to the emergency room, we usually put in IVs. We start with our baseline sort of nausea medicines and then we can escalate into other medications that are stronger and sort of to try to break the cycle. A lot of kids end up staying for a few hours and get fluids and are able to go home. And then we definitely have a subset who come in and need to be admitted overnight to the hospital for hydration in order to break this cycle. The trend overall in to help with the chronic um, marijuana use and hyperemesis is to stop use, um, knowing that you can definitely have withdrawal symptoms before it gets there. So that's sort of one of the larger pieces that we're seeing in terms of marijuana and substance use in the emergency room right now. The other concerning group that I've been seeing more of recently is the edibles and really the younger teenagers coming in and echoing with Dr. Armstrong saying not knowing how much they're getting and definitely having some respiratory depression and not being really in touch with reality at the moment and this lasting for hours overnight, needing admission and monitoring for that. And then we're seeing the very little kids getting into other people's edibles, um, thinking there's a can of gummy worm, or and you see all the pictures of how similar these look to candy, taking a handful and people not realizing until later that they've been into um, illicit substances. Um, and this can present as vomiting, confusion, sleepiness, difficulty breathing. The majority of these kids do well, but they definitely need monitoring. And if there's any concern for anything like this, please bring them to the emergency room. We usually check labs, give fluids and watch for hours until they are getting better. Um, and this is definitely on the rise as the edibles and the, especially the ones that are targeted to you know, look like candy are more available. People tend to leave them on the shelves and forget about them and young kids can get into them. So that's sort of a whirlwind of what we're seeing in the emergency room. And we are certainly seeing, as I said, sort of a decreasing in other substances, but a continued sort of steady state with alcohol and probably an increase in the vaping, marijuana, and edibles. Um, and associated with that, which I'm sure Dr. Boomer is gonna get into, is also the sort of concurrent issues with mental health and sort of their two separate issues, but definitely are going together with some of our teens. So that was a whirlwind overview, but I'm gonna pass it along to Dr. Boomer next and she can continue. Thank you, Dr. Lipowitz. And Dr. Buma, who is our Chief of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Newton Wellesley Hospital is gonna tell us a little bit more about her perspective when talking to our loved ones and our young adults about substance use. Thank you, Dr. Buma. 
Hi, thank you. I'm um, so glad to be here. Um, thanks for including me. So um, I'm just going to go over uh, some key points. I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes. Um, and uh, these are some of the things I'm going to cover. Um, one thing I want everyone to take away from tonight is that parents matter. Parents and caregivers matter. Um, I think a lot of parents feel that talking to their kids about substances, <clears throat> you know, isn't going to make any difference or they're going to learn it all in school, but it is really important to have this conversation um, with your loved ones, whether it's kids, teens, or, um, or adult loved ones. Um, so it's important to have the conversation. Um, to be clear about the rules, I'm going to talk about some communication strategies for when you're having difficult conversations, um, and then a few talking points, um, key things to kind of keep in mind when you are talking to your kids or teens. Um, and then just a little bit about what to do um, when you are worried. So um, my first key take home point is that parents and caregivers matter. Positive family influences like family bonding, consistent rules, um, reduce the risk of tobacco, marijuana, and other drug use among teens. Um, teens who believe that their parents would strongly disapprove of their substance use are le less likely to use substances. And there's also a lot of interesting data about um, family meals. So um, uh, families who have more than, I think it's more than three family meals per week. That could be breakfast, lunch, or dinner. It could, does not have to be long and drawn out. It could be a 15 minutes of sitting together. Um, but that uh, families who have um, consistent family meals, it doesn't have to be every member of the household, um, but just some of your members eating together can also um, make a big difference and decrease the rates of um, substance use, um, especially substance misuse and addiction, as well as other kinds of things like eating disorders and other mental health problems. So it's really important, um, you know, to talk to your kids in general. Um, but, you know, obviously in this presentation, I'm talking about uh, the conversations about substance use and alcohol use. Um, it's important to avoid normalization. So really talking to your kids about the risks that when you um, don't have I think, you know, that also sends a message um, to kids and uh, can be more normalizing than, um, than parents might realize. <laughs> so when we talk about having any kind of difficult conversation, um, whether it's with your kids, with, um, with colleagues, with friends, with um, your spouse, anybody, um, these are kind of our key points that we recommend keeping in mind. So um, being calm, curious, compassionate, and concerned. And I put these, the numbers by these because it is very important to do these in order. Um, it's, it's not as important to remember which order the calm, curious, and compassionate go in, um, but the concern has to come last. So being calm um, is really important for everybody involved and in having a difficult conversation that when emotions are running high, um, then you're all amygdala, no frontal lobe. Um, so when you're really, really angry or when your child's really angry or um, something has just happened, like they've just gotten caught or gotten in trouble, it's a really tough time to have an important kind of thoughtful conversation where any problem solving is going to take place because um, when emotions run high, we just can't think clearly. Um, so that step one is that when you're going to have this conversation, it's important to have it during a, a calm time, you know, maybe when you're taking a walk or in a car ride, but um, not at the kind of moment of heightened emotions. Um, then once everybody's calm and you're having the conversation, the next step is to be curious. So we say uh, talk less, listen more. Um, so this is where, you know, you have the opportunity to talk about you know, what questions they have, what experiences they have, what thoughts or concerns that they have, um, but just trying to get your, um, your child or teenager just talking about kind of what they know already, and what they're curious about, all those kinds of things. Um, step three is to be compassionate. So before jumping in with our um, concerns or suggestions, um, we really first need to validate that it's it's hard for our kids to really listen to what we're saying um, if they feel defensive or they feel judged or they feel like we're not understanding what they're saying. So even if during your curious moment, um, you start to hear things that you think that doesn't make sense or no, that's not right. It's important to kind of wait on that and to really validate the feelings <clears throat> and experiences. So validating the feelings and experiences, it doesn't mean you have to agree with what they're saying. It doesn't mean you have to approve necessarily of what they're saying, but you know, saying things like that sounds really frustrating or difficult or 
you sound nervous about that, um, you know, can go a long way to kind of opening the door to having a more um, fruitful conversation. And then the last one is after you've gone through all these other steps is where you get to express your concerns. Um, so where you can say, you know, just, you know, what you're worried about, um, you know, what you, what information you have, what facts you have, all of those kinds of things um, really can come out. And then the conversation can really kind of flow back and forth from there. Um, so when you're expressing your concerns, just some things to think about. So when you're talking about um, drugs and alcohol, it's really important that you have some good facts. So um, all of the presentations tonight, are, uh, our presentations tonight are so helpful um, to get kind of this background information. And there are a lot of good resources online um, where you can find out more. But, you know, just keeping it to the basics, substance use impairs judgment, and it might make it more likely for you to engage in high risk situations or for dangerous things to happen. And so, you know, that's kind of an obvious big general concern. You don't have to keep it um, or talk about specific substances necessarily, at least not in the first conversation. Um, you know, another key point that substance use can affect school performance. It can have short-term effects on attention, memory, focus, sleep, appetite, all those kinds of things. And there are a lot of substances that can have very long-term consequences um, in terms of academic performance, IQ levels. Um, there's a lot of data out there. Um, and so, you know, it's really important to have this conversation early, um, as early as you can. Getting caught um, could mean getting kicked off a sports team, jeopardizing college, there could be legal implications. So it's, you know, to kind of do your research ahead of time and think about really what are your concerns? Um, what are your reasons for saying to your kid or teen that you really don't want them using these substances? And then you can talk about um, and model healthy ways to cope with stress and anxiety, um, especially social anxiety as teens um, especially post COVID start to get in more social situations and start to think like, well, I don't know, I'm nervous, so I better use something to loosen up. But, um, but I think you really want to model for them um, kind of how to cope with difficult situations or anxiety provoking situations. Um, and also, you know, just talk to them about what their strategies might be. So a little bit more about the risks and consequences. Um, so when you're talking to your teen about um, consequences, I mean, you can certainly set rules and you can certainly every, you know, family can decide kind of parents can decide what the consequence is going to be if rules are broken in the household. Um, but I think it's really important to when you're having this conversation to frame it as this is going to be a consequence of your behavior or these are the potential downstream consequences rather than you do this and you're going to be punished. I think that um, kids are just more likely to be open and really and thoughtful about, um, you know, the choices they're going to make when you kind of frame it in that way. Um, the realities of alcohol and drug use, especially drug misuse and addiction are not pleasant. Um, physically, emotionally, socially, and sometimes financially, um, uh, because using drugs can be very expensive. Um, Safety is the priority. Some people um, like to think about a conditional amnesty policy. I'd be interested to see what the other panelists think about this idea. But um, this is the idea that you know, telling your teenager, look, if these are our rules, these are my expectations. But if you're in a dangerous situation, no matter the situation, you can call me and I will help, and we're, you're not going to get in trouble in that moment. It's not going to be, you know, a big blow up. You know, we'll talk about it the next day. We'll, you know, make sure that you're okay, but making sure somebody has a safe ride or they know what to do if they're worried about a friend. So it's really important to just do your best to um, kind of have the conversation so you can keep the lines of communication open. Um, this was already covered, but um, I just want to emphasize the importance of delaying um, use. So I think one thing I often talk to teenagers about is just don't use yet. If you really want to try these things, you know, wait and try them when you're older. Um, as you can see here, the younger somebody is when they first start using alcohol or marijuana, and the same is true of nicotine, um, the more likely it is that their lifetime um, their lifetime risk increases that they are gonna develop um, problematic use. <clears throat> I also hear a lot from teenagers, um, you know, well, it's, it's not bad that I'm using, I'm just using marijuana because it's not as bad as heroin um, or other drugs or, yeah, I drive high, but I don't drive drunk. Um, and I, you know, like to tell them that none of these things are good. They're all risky. And that just because you think something has a lower relative risk of something else, like, you know, it doesn't mean that there's no risk there. So, um, 
instead of the, hey, at least it's not crack, I think really talking about the different um, risks of different substances, if your teenager's interested in that, um, doing some research, but this is something I hear a lot from our teenagers. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of parents today feel like rule is a four letter word or that we can't really set clear boundaries and rules for our kids, but, um, but I think it is really important to do that, to really set rules and expectations and consequences. Um, and uh, helping our kids understand the potential consequences. Um, encourage your kids to make decisions when they're calm, when they know the facts, and when they're not around their friends. So it's really important to have these conversations, as I mentioned before, when everybody's calm. But, you know, kids can make really um, silly and impulsive decisions when they're around their friends, um, when, uh, when, they, when emotions are running high. But if you give kids a chance ahead of time to really think through, like, what is the choice you want to make about this? When this comes up for you, what are you going to decide to do? Like, let's make the decision now so you don't have to make it later when you're in a specific situation. It can also be helpful to tell your kids that it's okay to throw you under the bus. Um, you know, giving kids language to pra practicing language of what they can say when they're in the situation of being offered substances. Um, can be really helpful. No thanks, I'm not interested. Um, no, my parents would kill me. I have a big game coming up, different kinds of things. So it's, if you suspect problematic use in your loved one, some typical warning signs, increase in moodiness, irritability, and anger um, above what you would normally expect for a moody teenager, um, but kind of a big shift in what you're seeing in your um, child or teen or loved one. Um, acting intoxicated, sorry about the typo, slurred speech, forgetfulness, erratic behavior, um, they seem clumsy or unbalanced, um, they start stealing from you, you're finding, you know, money's missing from your wallet, or increased requests for money, lack of interest in activities that they used to have fun doing, um, and that could also be a lack of interest in their usual social group or a big shift in their social group, and then increased problems at school, grades dropping, unexplained absences, or discipline issues. There's a, a great tool on drugfree.org um, that you can click through if you're worried about a loved one. Um, so I, there's a link here, but if you go to drugfree.org, you'll be able to find it pretty easily. Um, but it's just an online anonymous tool that um, asks about 10 questions if you're worried about, um, if you think somebody might have a problem or might be using substances. Um, it's geared toward um, caregivers of teenagers, but, um, but is a very helpful resource. So starting the conversation, if you feel like this isn't really a prevention conversation, this is more of a, I'm noticing, um, you know, I'm noticing something's going on and I, we need to start to talk about it because I'm worried about you. Um, so identifying an appropriate time and place, expressing concerns and being direct about what your concerns are, acknowledging their feelings and listening, offering to help, reassuring them that um, substance use disorders are treatable, that there are resources and people who can help um, and to be patient and continue reaching out. So whether this is a prevention conversation or an, you're already worried that somebody um, you care about is, um, is using drugs or, or misusing alcohol, this is a conversation. It's not a one-time conversation. This is a multiple time conversation that's gonna come up over and over again. So um, it's okay if you bring it up and you get an eye roll or you get, um, you know, they don't wanna continue talking to you about it. Um, but I think if you try and stay open and um, approachable and bring it up again, hopefully if, at some point they'll be open to talking about it. Um, and these are, this is just from SAMHSA, some of the suggestions I see you're going through something. How can I support you? I've noticed you haven't seemed like yourself. How can I help? Um, so just some take home points, communicate, stay engaged, pay attention, make sure they know they can ask you or another adult for information or help. Become curious, compassionate before expressing your concerns. Um, they're listening, even if they act like they're not. So having this conversation um, with kids and teenagers, like I said, you'll often get the eye roll or they act like they're not listening, but they are hearing it. We say sometimes parenting a teenager is like flying a plane through the fog. Like, you know, your destination's there, they're out there somewhere, but you sometimes can't kind of see the clear signs that they're actually listening or care about the conversation, but, um, but they do, and it's important to have it. Um, keeping the lines of communication open, and that is all. Feel free to reach out with questions. Um, this is our Resilience Project email address. We have workshops for parents. Um, we do, uh, we give a lot of free support to our local public schools. So please reach out. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Buma. That was fantastic. We have a lot of great questions. Keep them coming uh, in the Q&A box. It makes it a little bit easier for, for me to see, but in the chat works as well. And I'll turn it over to Katie Sugarman. And Katie, if, if we can, it doesn't, it's not very fair to be the last presenter, but if you can keep it to 10 minutes, then we can have as much as possible time for, uh, for Q&A. That would be fantastic. Thank you. I will do my best to get through this as quickly as possible. Um, so hi, everyone. Again, my name is Katie Sugarman. I work for the Natick Health Department, and I'm just going to share just a little bit of what I've learned over the years about some of the community resources that are available um, to families and community members who might be worried about um, a loved one. Um, I just want to acknowledge that in Natick, we happen to have a coalition called Natick 180 that kind of approaches addiction as something that we just know exists in any community and that it and that any individual, any family can experience it, but it doesn't define a person, nor does it reflect how loving a family is or how much a community cares. And that's kind of the philosophy that we use as we bring together um, parents and youth and um, law enforcement and, and our school department and community organizations and treatment providers um, and medical professionals and folks in recovery to look at how can we work together to address substance use in our community. Um, and so in Natick, we have we use this approach of looking at it, what can we do as a community or as the environment around our, um, our families um, to, uh, to both um, prevent substance use before harms begin, but also so to intervene early um, when substance use begin, begins to become problematic, um, and how do we also support recovery? And while I recognize that this is a little bit of a, a Natick specific example, I want to acknowledge that coalitions like this exist in many of our communities, especially here in Massachusetts. Um, just off the top of my head, you know, Needham, Dedham, Waltham, Watertown, Wayland, um, as well as a number of community of other communities more um, out here in the Metro West area. Um, have coalitions like this. So I just mention it as a resource in case you're interested in looking into what your own community might offer. Um, you may want to um, Google your community and uh, look up substance use prevention and, and see what uh, resources might exist in your own town um, or city. Um, but in terms of um, resources, resources that are available if you're worried about a loved one substance use, um, I'm going to just briefly talk about kind of two different categories of resources, those that are really intended for a person living with substance use disorder, so the person who's actually experiencing the addiction or the, or the problematic substance use, as well as supports um, for family members. Um, and this is just kind of a, a quick overview of kind of what the current continuum of care looks like here in Massachusetts in terms of the different levels of care. Um, I'm not going to go into all these different clinical levels of care. I'm going to talk more about community-based supports, um, but um, there are this, this information is available on a, a number of the different websites that I'll be talking about. Um, and I do want to acknowledge I am going to be um, providing my slides after tonight, so uh, you will get a, a copy of all of these resources. So in terms of just accessing the continuum of care, how do I, if I'm worried about my child, my spouse, my loved one, how do I even start to access treatment or services? Um, the Massachusetts Substance Use Helpline is an incredibly wonderful resource that we have here in Massachusetts. Um, I have called the phone number. It's now a 24 seven um, helpline. Uh, it used to have um, operate, uh, limitations on those operational hours, but um, I have found the operators on there to be incredibly well-informed, caring, compassionate, and helpful folks. Um, and their website is really good as well. Um, of course, we have the Newton Wellesley Substance Use Services folks who um, have sponsored tonight's event um, if you happen to be here in more of the Metro West area, um, there's a, a new resource called the um, Care Connection Hub, which actually um, connects a number of different um, community-based and out patient treatment providers, um, including um, Wayside, Smock, um, Spectrum, um, and Advocates um, that uh, is really um, a wonderful resource, whether you're looking for services for an adolescent or an adult, if you're looking for assistance with mental health or substance use, um, they have established both this intake line and um, this website um, to really help kind of triage what are the levels of care that um, you, you or your family might be um, 
in need of, and also do a really great assessment of, well, it may be that substance use is the presenting concern, but it could be that there are some other issues um, like food insecurity or housing insecurity or, um, or kind of other social challenges that may complicate the situation and they will also connect folks to those additional social services. Um, many communities have um, a contract with the William James Interface Referral Line. Um, they will set up, um, they will match folks to an outpatient counselor based on uh, a person's health insurance. And so if you contact that phone number, if your community is one here in Massachusetts that contracts with them, they will actually um, help do some of the legwork of getting you or your loved one set up with an outpatient clinician. So um, they'll take your insurance information, um, the kind of some information on the presenting concerns. If you have preferences about say the gender of the clinician or some other identifying information, um, they will um, actually uh, kind of vet who some of the local clinicians are who meet those needs um, and actually help you connect with that clinician and then we'll follow up with you several weeks later so that if it was a good match they'll you know you can kind of continue on or if you need help finding somebody else they can help make that connection as well. I also want to acknowledge that in many of our communities, um, you know, pediatricians, school social workers, um, even if you have a youth and family services department in your community, there are really wonderful embedded social workers here in our communities that are often willing to help and can also help make some of those referrals. Um, and so to that end, kind of sticking with kind of this adolescent support theme, um, as I just mentioned in, the, in that last bullet about some of the professionals who may already be working with young people, um, Massachusetts General Hospital, um, the ARMS program is certainly um, a, wonderful, uh, a wonderful one that both works with um, a young person who uses substances as well. Um, as their, their parents or guardians, um, the Boston Children's Hospital Adoles Adolescent Substance Use um, and Addiction Program um, is another really wonderful resource. Um, one that a lot of people don't know about is uh, our Massachusetts Recovery High Schools. Um, we have um, actually last, I, I don't know if this has changed, but um, as far as I know, we here in Massachusetts have the highest concentration of recovery high schools um, out of any state in our country. Now, maybe that's changed in the past couple of years, but pre-pandemic, we had more recovery high schools than any other state. Um, and essentially, those are educational settings for high school students for whom um, attending kind of their, their, um, their regular high school in their community may just not be a good fit because their level of substance use has kind of interfered with their educational experience significantly enough that they need to be in a setting where they can um, really work on their recovery while they're also working on their academics. Um, and so um, there are several in uh, Massachusetts, as I mentioned, Ostagai High is the high school is the one in Boston that serves uh, the Boston metro region, uh, but it's a really um, good one to know about. And call to talk, the crisis text line is one that I, I work with youth um, in our community and I recommend that our youth just put that into their phones because um, it's actually a helpline that um, allows folks to actually access um, a mental health counselor who can actually assist them in the midst of a mental health or substance use crisis. Um, and so I think it's one that um, it, it's, not it's not only for adolescents, but I think, um, I think it's really helpful for adolescents to know that they have the power to access a support like that um, in real time if, if, they're, if they're struggling with a crisis. These are a few examples of some vaping um, quit supports. Um, quit Start is a free smartphone app. Um, you can also, um, young people can also contact hotlines for free counseling um, as well. And you can also do that via text. Um, and there are also a number of different websites that um, young people can go to for um, support in quitting vaping. And again, I, we will be sending these resources out afterwards. A few other community-based um, and self-help supports um, that are um, not necessarily, these are not for adolescents, these are for any age. Um, Massachusetts sober housing. So for folks who are looking, um, who know that they you know, need to be living in a um, drug or alcohol-free uh, housing setting, um, the um, Mass Sober Housing website is very helpful. Um, you know, 
in terms of both finding available um, sober houses, but also learning a little bit more about what they are and, um, and, and finding sober houses that are actually certified. This is something that Massachusetts is trying to do because historically um, kind of anybody could just um, purchase a house and start renting out rooms and claim that it's a sober house, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, a high quality experience for the folks who are living there. Um, and so the Mass Sober Housing website can help folks actually find certified sober houses um, that are um, uh, complying with certain um, expectations or standards to make them safe um, and healthy places for the folks who live in them. Of course, 12 step groups are self help uh, groups that a lot of people uh, have heard of They're They've been kind of part of our um, part of our society for decades now. Um, AA and NA are probably among the most well-known ones, um, but there are literally dozens of different types of 12-step groups for all sorts of um, behavioral health challenges. Um, I do want to acknowledge that many of these groups do offer um, youth or young adult meetings, um, and one of the um, kind of silver linings of the past couple of years of struggles through the pandemic is that actually there are more meetings available now that are virtual. And so it has traditionally been challenging to find youth and young adult meetings in a lot of communities. Um, you might have to drive several towns away in order to access those, but now there are actually some of them that are available online. And so you can go to these websites, search by certain demographic information, um, and you can get links, Zoom links to um, join some of these 12-step meetings all over the, the world, really. Um, if 12 step is not a model that somebody is interested in, there are also supports like smart recovery, smart recovery, um, unlike 12 step, which tends to have a little bit of a spiritual tradition to them, not, not religious, but sometimes, you know, an acknowledgement of a higher power, um, smart recovery, um, is, is self-help based, but does not, um, does not invoke a higher power in its approach. Refuge recovery is actually based more on um, Buddhist principles and actually is a recovery approach that integrates um, a lot of um, meditation. Um, and, you know, something that's also kind of happening more and more in many of our communities um, are uh, embedded um, behavioral health clinicians and recovery coaches um, in police departments and in community health settings um, in, in uh, Natick and in a number of other communities. There are clinicians embedded who actually ride along with our police officers to provide mental health and, and substance use referrals um, and crisis management. I also just want to acknowledge that harm reduction is something that's been found to be really, um, you know, critical in terms of um, meeting people where they are. And if they're not ready to completely stop using substances, um, trying to help them reduce their use and reduce the harms of their use. Um, we know that fentanyl is in our street drug supply in a lot of different substances. And so we really encourage anybody who's either actively using drugs, anybody who's in recovery and their family members and their immediate loved ones around them to get trained in Narcan, um, which is also known as naloxone. Um, in Natick, we actually distribute it um, through our public health department for free to the community. Um, but it's also available at any Massachusetts pharmacy. There's a standing order for all Massachusetts pharmacies to make it available. You can also look on uh, the uh, MassGov website and get a list of other um, Narcan distribution sites throughout the state. Um, and I will just acknowledge there's a picture here of this uh, van um, here in Metro West. There's actually a new Rise On van that's sponsored by um, our partners at JRI Health that will actually go into communities, provide Narcan training, and also uh, pro provide um, mobile health services, including referrals for treatment and, and recovery supports. Um, these folks actually were at our medication take back day this past weekend, um, collecting sharps from folks who, while they, while, while they were also turning in their unused medications. Um, and lastly, in terms of resources for families, um, outpatient counseling, again, going through a couple of the um, points of contact that I already mentioned, outpatient counseling is really important for the person who may be experiencing substance use disorder, but the family around them really could benefit often from their own either family therapy or individual counseling. Um, you know, addiction really impacts the, an entire family unit. Um, and so um, each person often deserves the time and opportunity to kind of process the impacts of that substance use. 
um, themselves. Um, there are also 12 step groups um, that are specifically for families, such as Al Anon, Alateen, Naranon. Um, and I can't say enough about Learn to Cope, which is a Massachusetts based um, and peer led group um, that was started by parents who, um, who saw, you know, who had lived through the experience of loving a child with um, substance use disorder and who really wanted to support other parents and kind of have come together and grown this amazing network. Um, there are also parent coaches who support each other. Um, the partnership to end addiction. If you go to that website, you can actually set up um, texting conversations and also set an appointment to actually talk to a parent who's gone through this process before. We're fortunate in Natick to actually have a couple who are parent coaches for the partnership to end addiction, but who also run a communication workshop series in Natick. We don't limit it to Natick residents. So if you're ever interested in participating in that workshop series, um, it's uh, the, the, the folks who run it are just really incredible. And then lastly, I'll just mention the community reinforcement and family training um, model. Um, that is one that's used in that um, Learn a Better Way communication workshop series I mentioned. Allies for Recovery is actually a website you can go to to learn that model. Um, and um, this book here recommended read that I've listed here, Beyond Addiction, also gives a little bit more information about that. And I'll just wrap up here by acknowledging the serenity prayer, which is kind of core to those 12 step groups that I was talking about, uh, which is God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And I hope we can just take those words with us tonight um, as we kind of find the grace in, with ourselves and with our loved ones um, as we learn how to kind of manage our behaviors and our emotions through these kind of challenging topics. So thank you. Katie Sugarman, thank you so much for all of these resources. It's uh, it's nice to sometimes know where to turn, and I'd like to have invite all the speakers and panelists to please put on your videos. And this was excellent. I think we had such a nice overview of sort of what are the drugs that are out there, what are we seeing uh, in in people who are acutely not doing so well, and how do we treat that when when they come to the hospital. Dr. Boomer reviewed for us really about well how do, how do we even talk about drug use with our with our children and uh, and then Katie reviewed a lot of the many resources that we have out there. So I, I wanted to turn to you first, Dr. Boomer. And um, one of our uh, attendees asked that when I first got wind of pot use in my late teenage son, I approached it with the four C's. So that's good. <laughs> and he said, uh, but dad, I learned it from you and you turned out okay. So how do we do this? You know, and, and, and also what if your kids ask you, uh, have you done drugs before? How, how are we as parents supposed to answer this and uh, address these concerns when our kids have potentially heard that, that the, that the parent has also tried some of these substances? I think it's a great question, and um, and I think there's not an easy answer here. It's the answer is going to be different <clears throat> for different families, um, you know, for different kids, different parents. So I think some things to think about are what when you're talking to your kid and they ask you if you've used before. I think it's really it's important to think about like what do you what are you trying to accomplish with your answer. So I think some parents, you know, feel like they have to be honest in order to keep communication open, um, you know, and I don't think that's necessarily the case. We don't have to have full disclosure to our kids about everything that we've ever done. I think if the answer is that telling your kids about your own experience is going to serve a purpose that's going to help them on their journey, that's going to help them stay away from substances or going to help them um, keep the lines of communication open, then I think it's okay to share in a, you know, in a limited kind of developmentally appropriate way. You want to be careful not to glamorize um, past use or talk about your glory days, or um, I think some parents can kind of get into like oh, I'm, you know, I was cool when I was a teenager um, and then inadvertently kind of glamorizing this behavior. And we definitely don't want to do that. I think it's also really important for parents to send the message that um, I don't know if this parent was talking about his own cannabis use as an adult or that he used when he was a teenager, but, you know, use of drugs and alcohol by teenagers is very different than use by adults. The risks associated with um, with marijuana use, with alcohol use, with nicotine use, and with other drugs, the risks are much higher for, um, for kids and teenagers than they are for adults. 
the developing brain is very sensitive and, you know, there can be long-term changes and long-term consequences, even if they don't have the consequence of, you know, like a physical injury or, you know, legal consequences. But so I think it's, it's important that um, parents communicate that if they're seeing them use as an adult or them drink as an adult, that that's very different than use in childhood, um, that the developing brain is very different. So I think there are just some different things to think about, but there's not one right answer. Um, that's excellent. Know. So, yeah. well, but how do we say, I guess I would go back to Dr. Armstrong and another attendee that just made a comment is, you know, how do we, how do we distinguish between sort of recreational use, even in young people when it's not really good for the young brain versus when it's too much, like, how do you know if it's too much? And, and what if the kid, our, our kids or family members say, well, I own, I only do it recreationally. I don't only do it a little bit. What, what are the signs that it's too much or how do we talk about that without sounding kind of like we're blaming our family member or that they're a bad person? Um, how, how would you address that Dr. Armstrong when it comes to uh, that question of what's too much and what's recreational? Well, I think it's, I think it's a difficult question because um, you know, the data that, that we're aware of and that, um, that Dr. Boomer referenced and that, that I, I am aware of is that really with the developing brain, um, it, it's hard to know, especially with the high levels of let's take marijuana um, uh, and vaping. It, it's, it, it's difficult to justify, um, you know, recreational use um, in any form because it, it can be, it can be um, dangerous in a developing brain. So, um, you know, if a, if a t child or teen has already started, um, I think that's what you're getting at is, is how to not kind of be in a blaming situation, but really saying like, you know, how, how can we, um, using those four C's and starting with calm, how can, can we as parents be a support for you to, to get to a healthier, um, healthier place and healthier choices that, that um, are not going to uh, damage uh, your growing brain? And, and, and we're worried about this because of what we know in terms of the, the science right now in a, in a young person. Um, so... So should we tell, be telling our kids, um, Dr. Buma as well, uh, that they shouldn't be doing anything because they're putting their brain at risk and we know that they're going to anyway. So what about in moderation as one of the attendees asked? Well, we, we don't know that they're going to anyway. Um, actually, the majority of teenagers don't use drugs um, and don't drink alcohol. I think it's a big um, misconception when you ask teenagers how many of your peers um, use marijuana, for example, and then um, but then you look at the data of how many are actually using marijuana. The perception is like everyone does it, um, but the reality is it's not true. Everyone doesn't use it, and, and you don't... I hear a lot of parents say, well, I can't stop my kid from using marijuana. All the kids are using marijuana. And I mean, it, that's not true. Um, you can, you can have these conversations, you can set rules and guidelines, you can set consequences. I think it is the, the marijuana of today is extremely potent. It's much, much riskier than the marijuana of my high school days or my parents' high school days. It's unfortunate, but true. The potency is just through the roof and it's very, it's just much more dangerous now. So I don't think it's the case that kids, I mean, I wouldn't say that about opiates, like, well, you can't stop your kids. They're going to use heroin. So you might as well let them use it a little bit. I just, I disagree with that. I think alcohol is different and, you know, I think it's different in other countries and you have to kind of think about what you're going to do in your family in terms of moderation and exposure. And that's a, you know, a different conversation, but certainly where um, other drugs are concerned. That's my take on it. What do you think, Dr. Well, Armstrong? That's, that's excellent. I'm actually going to follow with Dr. Leibowitz. Oh. Um, and, and, uh, and then I'll let Dr. Armstrong chime in in a moment, but one of, one of the attendees asked is sort of, well, what about drug testing? And so first of all, um, could you clarify us, how do you test for drugs? And then the follow-up question is, can we just test our kids for drugs or like what, and how do we do that? How do we order it? So, so first of all, how do you test for drugs when someone comes to the emergency department? Both are excellent questions. So there's two sets of uh, drug testing. The basic, um, mostly we call them drugs of abuse, so the illicit drugs that we're talking about are urine tests. So the usual um, uh, sample, a pee sample when somebody comes to the emergency room. And the other 
testing is blood work is really mostly for alcohol and when we're concerned about overdoses of other medications, so like Tylenol, um, aspirin, and other things. But the majority of drug testing that we do is on urine, except for alcohol. Now, I will say that if you have a child or a person who is 18 or older, that you cannot force them to do any of this testing. Um, if they're in an emergency setting and they are comatose or we are worried about them and as the medical providing team need to figure out what is the cause. We certainly do a broad range of tests and that might include drug testing at the time um, because we need to medically do that. But if you're bringing in a loved one or child who is underage, this is where it gets a little tricky and fuzzy for us. And I don't know the exact right answer. And I can sort of say how I work and how other people work is that you can request as a parent drug testing as the provider taking care of that child, I always ask a family and tell them I would much prefer them to ask and make this a full disclosure. And I do not like to do it without asking permission. Um, in the end, if the family, if the child doesn't give permission and they don't go to the bathroom, it's not really something you can force. So it's, it is a tricky situation. I usually like to have this as a conversation where I can facilitate the pluses and minuses of making it a calm, reflective experience and trying to get people to the right person. Um, I think somebody just asked where to get in that in the community and I would have to put that back to Dr. Armstrong, but I know a lot of the pediatricians in the community are available and able to do this testing such and also in programs like the ARMS program, the Children's and the BMC program that once you're in those programs, they sort of have contracts about testing and it's usually urine samples at certain times. But I would uh, put that back to Dr. Armstrong. So I guess my question to Dr. Armstrong then is, is urine drug testing, does that have, have to be uh, consensual? Meaning that the person consents to doing it. Um, and it sounds like there may be some legal implications, but let's talk more generically for anyone over the age of 14, that 14 is that age. Um, you can't just make someone get, you can't steal a urine sample, right? I mean, um, and what's the, what's the utility of getting a urine sample and how, how would you maybe sell it to someone to say why it's a good idea to give a urine sample? Could you address that, Dr. Armstrong? Sure. I and if it's even, and if it's necessary, is it necessary? So um, I wanted to back up, um, and this is related to this question, but you know, the question around the concern about kind of recreational use, use at all, um, is, is really, you know, it sounds a little maybe corny, but, but bringing that teen into the, into the conversation of concern, the science, right? So sitting down, not looking at, you know, big weighty studies, but looking at sort of some of the basic concerns that, that you as a parent can see. And there's amazing websites that are through NIDA for teens and parents and kids that actually look at, you know, this is what happens to young brains that are developing when they use alcohol to, you know, before age 14 or marijuana before, you know, age, age 16 to 18 or whatever it is. And sort of looking at that with your teen, having that conversation about sort of why, why the concerns are there. They're there because this is, this is the data I'm looking at. What do you think of that? So I think, you know, I, you, you did such a beautiful job, Dr. Buma, in, in having these, these conversations, but sharing that information with your teen and they, they're smart, they know, they get it, they, they can understand this, but, but that I, I think allows for a conversation of, can, of that final C, that concern. Um, and it becomes maybe sets it up for not being something sort of just don't do this, but instead, this is the this is the data behind this. This is why I'm worried. Let's talk about it. So I just wanted to to clarify that and just to mention some of the sites that parents can go to, which um, NIDA, NIDA, and SAMHSA have great parent teen workshops um, uh, um, and and data that people can look up to kind of think about how those conversations can happen. Um, in terms of the testing, um, um, so so testing can be done as as you mentioned the arms program through the pediatrician's office. Um, and um, often, you know, it is uh, uh, urine testing. It's it's often um, uh, blood testing for certain other things, such as alcohol. But in terms of the testing itself, is 
you know, asking, asking the teen first about the testing, explaining why it's there. Um, reasons for getting that testing without the teen's consent are areas of around concern. You know, uh, is that teen at risk for self-harm? Is there, is there other legal ramifications that have to be taken to get that testing? Um, but those, those would be, those would be um, sort of under the guidance of the clinical team, maybe the psychiatric team in an ER where that, that teen's um, volition for testing would be removed sort of in areas of concern, I believe. And I can, I can get some more information on that, but that's my understanding. Thank you. And I think some of these resources we'll, we'll put together also for all, all the attendees so that we can uh, address that. So I'd, we're uh, rolling to the end of the, uh, of the 8.30 hour, and I wanted to ask Katie Sugarman, this has been excellent, informative for all of us, and I think the resources are going to be invaluable to, to everyone. Katie, uh, you know, what's it, what's it like to go to a family support group? And sometimes it seems hard to know when, it, when should someone go? When should someone seek that out? And it, it does sound quite intimidating, but what's uh, the, more than just the obvious benefit of talking to other people that are going through the same thing. What's your perspective on, on what support groups can do and when we should go there when we're worried about our family member? Sure. Well, you know, in my experience of talking with um, parents and families who have gone through this process, it's often going to a support group meeting is often not the first thing that anybody wants to do. It feels intimidating. I think both because people just don't know what to expect when they go, but also because I think it means that you may actually be acknowledging that there is a substance use disorder issue in the family. And that's, that's, that's often like the biggest hurdle to overcome, I think, initially, and just recognizing, because I think we often tell ourselves and we believe that these types of things only happen to other people. And it's just not the case. I mean, I have yet to meet a person in my personal or professional life that hasn't had this somewhere in their family or in their immediate circle of friends. It's just, it's just that common. And so, um, you know, I think acknowledging that there's something going on in family dynamics that revolve around substance use, that's becoming, um, it's, it's interrupting the family dynamics in some way. It's creating safety concerns. Um, and those could be physical safety concerns, but they could also be emotionally. It could be that people, people in the family are feeling emotionally unsafe. Um, you know, addiction kind of thrives when kind of everyone tiptoes around the issue and just kind of avoids talking about it. And so, um, often, kind of destabilizing that <laughs> can feel scary, but that's why these support groups, these especially peer-led support groups can be so powerful because you're talking to parents who have had to come overcome those same hurdles, who've had the same fears, the same worries. Um, and so not only can you get really great tips from those folks who have been there, um, you can also get kind of a sense of um, collegiality and connection and network that just feels like, okay, I'm not the only one that's felt this way. I'm not alone. Um, there, are, there are people who know what this is like, and they're not judging me for my kid. Because that's the other thing too, right, is that so often we're afraid to acknowledge it because we're afraid that our child or our loved one's going to get labeled. And we don't want that for them because we love them so much. So it's coming from all of these, our own insecurities and our worries and our fears and our love for that other person. And the people in those groups understand that they've been there. Thank you for that advice, Katie. I think Dr. Armstrong highlighted that although uh, the title of this is that drug use is on the rise, it seems that we may be in a place where drug use might be stabilizing. But where the difference is, is we're seeing more people dying, more people having ill adverse health effects, mental health effects, so that although the the rates may not have moved in certain age groups, we are seeing the really terrible consequences of the high THC, uh, the fentanyl that's being laced in many of the substances that are out there in the pills that are being manufactured. So that's where the risks really lie. And that's where an addiction can really find, uh, find its root. So as we recognize that, uh, that there's a lot out there. There's also hope. There are a lot of really excellent resources in our communities at Newton Wellesley Hospital. And we're all here to be a resource for, for uh, those in our towns. 
So we thank you very much for coming tonight and know that we'll have some more excellent conversations to come. And please send us any additional questions that might arise and look out for the email and the resources. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you to all our panelists. You were excellent. Good night, everyone. <laughs>